Saudi Arabia, United States, India, South Africa, Trinidad and Tobago, Sudan, Belize, Jamaica, Japan, Costa Rica, Brazil, Panama, Italy, Dominican Republic, Espana, Nigeria, Venezuela, Ireland, and Russia. So yes, um, I would like to introduce um, you guys to all the countries that we have here. And actually we have students from these countries also attending Garden and also Albany State. Let's just welcome them with a warm, warm applause. The uh, parade of flags, oh that is just beautiful. And I um, would applaud International Education Week and the fact that we are talking and communicating with each other. I think that will make a whole lot of difference uh, in the world. But I'm very proud this morning to be here to represent the city of Albany and to present this proclamation by the mayor. Whereas, within the context of the Board of Regents' new strategic plan and other dynamic factors that are transforming undergraduate, undergraduate education in the United States, and around the world. Global knowledge, skills, attitudes have become core expectations of student learning. And whereas Albany State University has contributed much to our community, with its graduates playing a vital role in Doherty County's history and growth. And whereas Albany State University, in collaboration with Darden State College, International Education Week celebration is being observed from November 14th through November 18th, 2016. And whereas Albany State University's International Education Week brings more awareness about global knowledge and skills among our students, faculty, and staff. And whereas Albany State University will work closely with the Board of Regents of the University System of Georgia in bringing out all the changes required to meet the current challenges of preparing students for success in the 21st century. Now, therefore, I, Dorothy Hubbard, Mayor of the City of Albany, Georgia, do hereby proclaim November 14th through November 18th, 2016, as International Education Week in the City of Albany, Georgia, and commend Albany State University for their commitment to higher education, including international education. I further encourage the students, administration, faculty, and staff of Albany State University to continue their endeavors to provide and promote international ed education. In witness whereof, I have hereunto set my hand and caused the seal of the city of Albany, Georgia to be affixed. And it's signed, Dorothy Hubbard, Mayor, Sonia Talbert, City Clerk. Congratulations to you. Thank you so much. Thank you for coming. Thank you for coming. Now we'll have um, Dr. Fontenot, who is our Associate Provost and Vice President of Academic Affairs, who has a few words for us about preparing ASU for the global world. Good morning. Good morning. And thank you for coming uh, out to support the International Education Week. A special thank you to Mayor Dorothy Hubbard uh, for this proclamation. We do appreciate that. To students, faculty, staff, again welcome. My name is Olufunke Fontino, Associate Provost uh, for the new Albany State University. I am honored to welcome you to this opening ceremony of the International Education Week. I bring greetings on behalf of Albany State University President, Dr. Arthur Dornin, who as a matter of fact is in California today attending 
uh, an international education program for HBCU uh, presidents organized by the University of Pennsylvania Minority Serving Institution um, program. I also bring greetings on behalf of Dr. Tal Kadi, the provost and VPAA. Again, he's uh, otherwise engaged, but uh, we are well represented here, and that really shows the support of the institution for uh, international uh, education. The theme of this year's International Education Week is ASU and DSC celebrate the world. When we have this program next year, it will simply be ASU celebrates the world. We would have successfully integrated or at, uh, both institutions. The program and events showcase the diverse and rich cultures of the world and the representation of those cultures here in Albany by our students, our faculty, and staff. The age of isolation is long gone. We are part of a global community. As such, we must be more intentional in aligning the goals and outcomes of undergraduate education with the realities of an interdependent and interconnected world. The problems the world faces today is qualitatively different. They are more complex, more interdisciplinary, and more directly tied to understanding other nations and cultures. An internationalized curriculum including study abroad provides a forum or an arena in which students can challenge their worldview, their assumptions about others, develop new perspectives, test new identities, and make new commitments to the world. The knowledge and skills that students develop during their undergraduate years should serve them well in an interconnected world. And that is our mission, or at least an important part of our mission, to prepare, the, uh, to prepare our students, our graduates, for entrance into the global century to make them hopefully effective contributors to the society, the global society. So this, therefore, is the direction and focus of the new ASU internationalization efforts. Specifically, we will enhance student capacity for global citizenship and engagement through our curricular and co-curricular programs. We will seek to explore, and I quote, the big global questions that demand integration of knowledge, skills, and personal and social responsibilities. We cannot solve our problems domestically or even the problems of the world by operating in silos. The problems are, as I've, I've said, complex, and they need all of the resources from various disciplines to address those problems. So we will seek to approach those big questions in an interdisciplinary manner. We will explore through our curriculum interdependence, power, and privilege. We talk about the challenges of globalization. There are many people who feel that that sort of threatens their existence within their domestic arena. So what are the issues of powers and privileges that are really important in, in understanding in globalization? It is incumbent on us as an institution to make sure that our students are also exposed to those. We will provide multiple opportunities for students to address global issues at an increasing level of complexity and I, I did mention from an interdisciplinary perspective. So we are going to go beyond the core courses. How do we engage them in some of these big questions in their majors as well? So to that end, the uh, consolidation work group on international programs and the implementation, uh, consolidation implementation committee have put together a strategic plan which hopefully will guide the new ASU uh, beginning January. And uh, the plan includes, the goal is to increase the number of our graduates 
with significant international experience by infusing international and comparative perspective throughout the curriculum and, and our co-curricular programs. And this would include teaching research and also uh, study abroad opportunities as well as uh, community services. Specific objectives include increasing the number of students who participate in study abroad, international internship, research, and service learning opportunities. We also recently approved a global citizenship certificate program. It's a 15 credit hour program that provides opportunity for students to show their competencies in uh, international, internationalization or competencies in understanding other cultures. So I welcome you here again today. And for students, I urge you to take every opportunity you have that we offer you here at ASU. Your education is a passport to travel and explore the world. And I mean that in more, uh, in, uh, more in many ways, metaphorically and pr in practical ways. Let your imagination take you afar. Seek friendships across the divide. Take opportunities you have amongst you here with the number of international students that are here present on campus, as well as faculty. I would like to thank Dr. Sakwe, Director of the Office of Global Programs, and her staff, and everyone who has helped in putting this program together. Your leadership is critical to the new ASU's role in graduating global citizens who can help change the world for the better. Thank you, and again, welcome. Um, and now, um, we have a student presentation by Trinity White, who is the secretary, and Kyle Brown, vice president of the Model African Union Club and SDMAU. Thank you so much. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Uh, once again, I just want to thank you all for having me here. I'm very humbled to see all of you all. Um, this is a very beautiful program. And I just want to, once again, want to thank everyone for coming. My name is Kyle Brown. I'm a 21-year-old political science major from Albany State University. Um, and I have a question. By show of hands, how many of you guys want to know more about Africa? By show of hands. OK. Keep your hands up if you want to fix some of the problems in Africa. Okay, perfect. So I come here this morning to talk to you about the Model African Union Club, which you guys who all had your hands up will be a perfect fit. We are a club that embodies the concept of bringing more awareness to the problems of Africa. Our vision, which states shedding light on African culture and create a, lead, a network of leaders who are inspired to tackle the problems of Africa is what we stand firmly on. Currently, we are working to tackle the problems of Morocco at the Southeastern Model African Union, which brings together universities, leadership, leaders, leader, student leaders, and empowers students to be leaders and helps students to tackle the problems of Africa. We all have to put our heads together, come together, and figure out the best ways to tackle the problems of Africa with people from all over the country and from all around the world. We sit on different committees. We tackle problems such as how to deal with the economy, democracy, social matters such as Ebola, HIV, and AIDS. And we also work on continental unity, and last but not least, peace and security. Our solutions are then submitted to the leaders and ambassadors in Africa to be implemented to help people thrive. But it all starts with you guys who raise your hands for both of the questions that I asked. We need you, we want you, and we need your help to change the world, Africa, and make the lives of the people there better. I'm gonna be, I was, I told myself I would be very brief, but I really just wanna make sure that everyone understands that we can't really do anything if we don't work together. 
So we have to work together. And this club, the South African, uh, the Model African Union Club, we came together and we decided, you know what, we want everyone to be a part of it. So why not just make it a club and then everyone can also, you know, work with the Southeastern Modern African Union. So today I will be here um, all day. And what I will do is, if you want to be a part of the club, I will have my phone and I will have a sign-in sheet. And just give me your name and I will contact you. And we'll sit down and we can all, you know, just tackle the problems of Africa and everything that we want to do so we can impact this world, impact Africa, and most importantly, start impacting our community. Thank you guys so much. One of the other clubs we have, and I, I, I'm going to recognize uh, Maria. We don't have you on the program, but I want you to stand up, please. Mar Maria is the president of the Cultural Exchange Club here on the Darton campus. And um, over here on the Darton campus, and we're trying to expand onto the ASU campus. And um, just tell them this is briefly what the aims of the club. Well, the Culture Exchange Club is about knowing more cultures and most of the international students here are not recognized. They're like, they're known as students, but they're not known as international students. Most of the students, they ask, where are you from? And Ecuador, like, where's that? Um, I don't want that anymore. I want the countries to know here. Um, I want the students to be more recognized. I want the international students to have more voice in campus. So that's my goal for the club. So it's not only for international students, it's for local students to, to share all cultures. Thank you. Um, OK, and now we have our special speaker for the day. Um, this is Mr. Manuel Matos. He is a Pan-African Human Rights and Labor Activist. Um, he um, is currently his fourth year PhD student of sociology at the University of Massachusetts Amherst as an international solidarity coordinator with the Black Women's Mobilization for the Care of Life and Ancestral Territories. He's organized dozens of presentations, workshops, and information sessions on Afro-Colombian and Black land struggles in Latin America. As a member of the Coordinating Committee of the Afro-Colombian Solidarity Network, Manuel coordinates fundraisers, calling campaigns, and travel delegations in support of Black land rights in Colombia. His research focuses on the politics of Black and collective land ownership, examined through the poetic politics of land and territorial, territoriality in black women's writing and political organizing, with special attention to work, labor, and mothering. Everybody welcome Manuel Bacos. Bueno, good morning. And, um, it's a, it's a tremendous privilege and an honor and incredibly humbling for me to be here. Uh, I am originally from the Dominican Republic, so I saw my plataneros bringing the Dominican flag through here and it felt good. Uh, and it really is a, a very purposeful visit. Uh, I, I immigrated into the United States when I was around 10 years old and my family most Dominican families migrated to New York City. We arrived in the Bronx, in the South Bronx, in 1991, and moved over to the Mecca of Dominican immigrants in Washington Heights, in Upper Manhattan. Um, and my being here, I think it's part of the lived examples to the extent that international education is really a lifelong personal project. And it's wonderful to see that this institution has had the vision and that this wonderful historic town has had the, the leadership to support international education because it really brings you places that once maybe you never thought you'd be, but will find you kin and family in places you didn't know you had them. And with that in mind, 
uh, is I'd like to go forward with the presentation, which is all about trying to bridge our families across continents and international divides. Um, I think uh, most of us are at least relatively aware of the tremendous impact that our history has had uh, in displacing our ancestors and placing us where we are today. This map here shows, is from archival data from a research project at Harvard University to collect all of the documented evidence of every single ship that traveled with our ancestors across the void of the Atlantic onto the new, so-called new world. Each one of those dots is a ship, the size of the ship, the size of the dot, more or less represents the, the size of the population in the ship. And you saw that it started in the 1500s and it's going to go for about 300 years. And that's the, the tremendous amount of, of ships represented increases. Take note that the video is not speeding up. That's just the, the tremendous increase in the rate of the importation of our ancestors. One of the things that I want to point out very intentionally is to pay attention to the location of where the ships are going to. And notice that the great majority of them are going into the Caribbean, going into northern South America, and certainly going to Brazil. And you'll see that despite the fact that we, in here is not represented secondary and tertiary de destinations, uh, we see that the majority of the peoples of our ancestors that were enslaved and transported into the New World were brought to places outside of the United States. And I don't say that in the ever so popular competition of sorts or um, divisions that can sometimes be falsely exacerbated, but I mean that as a way of pointing out that most of the people that were enslaved were family members in their original sites of, of living, in their original homes. And they were purposely sent to different places of the world based on supposedly economic need and also on a very deliberate strategy of separating us from each other. And being here today is not gratuitous. There's very few of us, very few of Afro-descendants who have the opportunity to reach uh, a PhD program, and certainly very few of us in the Dominican Republic that have an opportunity to come down to the heart and spiritual home place of this country, which is the South, and the tremendous beauty and history of the African-American community here. And the broader point is to try to invite us to think uh, and reflect on the extent to which we are each other, except for the fact that we are perhaps a boat stop away from speaking another language, from carrying another national flag, from having a different, an entirely different perspective and history in the world. And the kinds of things that International Education Week and the kinds of things that a, gl a global affairs program can do is highlight the extent to which our histories are actually very, very much linked. I use the example of the enslavement of an ancestor because I know that for many of us it has a very strong emotional pull. And that is not something to be afraid of. It is our history. It is part of our history. And here we are in 2016 with many opportunities to continue writing our own history and making that one of unity and self-discovery. Uh, so the presentation said, I, I work a lot with black women's poetry. And I think that this poem uh, helps characterize a little bit of the of the complex set of emotions and perspective associated with really taking a, a, a very close look at our history and the way that we are tied despite our 
geographic differences. I specifically like this, uh, the second stanza onward, where it says, I've been praying, and these are what my prayers look like. Dear God, I come from two countries. One is thirsty, the other is on fire, and both need water. Later that night, I held an atlas in my lap, ran my fingers across a whole world, and whispered, where does it hurt? And it answered, everywhere, everywhere, everywhere. It is a poem by Warsaw Shire that I think can help us settle ourselves in our emotions, in an ancestral link that many of us feel and sometimes work very hard to ignore. But I think that it is an important and powerful thing that can help drive not just our own personal lives, but the policies we in implement in academic institutions and our institutions of governance. And to a large extent, I think it's part of the spirit that drives an administra a town administration, a city administration, and a university officials to create and support an international week such as this. The, this uh, graphic here represents the relative percentage of Afro-descendant populations in Latin American countries. There's an interesting fact up here about the very nature of the ways that we were separated from each other. Notice that left to the east of Venezuela, Suriname, for example, and French Guinea are not included in the data set because they are apparently not part of Latin America, yet they have tremendously large Afro-descendant populations. So Brazil, uh, arguably the, the biggest harbinger of the great myth of racial democracy, is, has the largest black population in the Western Hemisphere, followed by the US and Colombia with 10 million, at least 10 million black citizens, is the third large, has the third largest black population in the Western Hemisphere. And if we think back to the previous video in the beginning and highlight the point that our ancestors were family members, around a quarter of the people uh, enslaved and brought over on the ships were children under 13 years of age. The rest were adults and most were related to each other. So in many ways, you, we, have kin, we have family, south of the south, all over the Caribbean, all over South America, and certainly in our African motherland. Colombia is a, I, I've taken a particular interest in Colombia for many reasons. Uh, one of them, uh, and they're all related to a large extent, to its location in South America. Colombia is the only South American country with access to two, water, two main waterways, the Caribbean Sea and the Atlantic Ocean and the Pacific Ocean on the Western Front. And I'll be focusing primarily here on the coast of, on the Pacific Coast, because that is where the largest population, concentration of the black population in Colombia is located. Taking great inspiration from the civil rights movement here in the United States and certainly in the Caribbean and to a large extent the uh, liberation, national liberation movements in the African continent, uh, folks in Colombia were able to achieve, uh, and take advantage and participate in a tremendous political crisis that occurred in Colombia in the late 1980s that resulted in an entire uh, revision an, in, an entirely new constitution that was adopted by the Colombian state in 1991. And one of the main things that this constitution did was recognize that Colombia is a multi-ethnic state. They rejected the previous uh, myth of one homogeneous community, recognizing the ethnic diversity in the country, and ultimately led to Law 70 of 1993, 
that recognize that the Afro-descendant populations in Colombia, 10 million of them, do have constitutional recognized rights to self-determination on social, political, economic, environmental, and cultural matters that are not only protected by, international, by the constitutional law, but are also protected by international law, given that Colombia has signed, is a signator of the International Labor Organization, which has Article 169 that protects ethnic communities from um, eminent domain. It protects ethnic communities, the territorial rights of ethnic communities in, major in majority countries. And more than anything, it protects the right of ethnic communities to have and possess collective land titles. And that is a tremendous difference from most countries, not just in Latin America, but certainly in the United States. Whereas here in the US, the African American communities has lost, has gone from 15 million acres of land owned by black communities here, we're down to less than 2.5 million acres of land. The apex of African American land ownership came in 1916. And now we're, uh, and it reached around 15 million acres, and now they're down to around 2.5. In Colombia, black communities that have been able to collectively titled 12 million acres of land. And it'd be much more uh, land had some of the repercussions and the repression that I'll go through very quickly later on had not been in press. And a big component of this of why this is important is that it, these lands, collective titles, uh, are, not, are very different from individual land holdings like there are done here in the United States. Mm -hmm. The state cannot come in and claim eminent domain on collectively titled land, like is so often done here in the United States as a mechanism of removing people from their lands. And a big, big, big problem here all over the South is that uh, collectively titled land can also not be put in lien. You cannot take a, la a loan out on land that is collectively owned by a community. I think if any of us have taken the opportunity to talk to black farmers all over the South, you will very quickly hear stories about how one of the primary tactics of uh, removing black peoples from their lands is to entrap them in predatory lending that does not only relate to the real estate market pertaining to housing, but also the real estate market pertaining to farmland. You can imagine, as it was here, that any time a group of people, an ethnic minority, comes together and fights for their rights, there is tremendous amount of repression. I've learned a little bit about that story here in Albany over the years. And unfortunately, that is a very similar case to what is happening in Colombia, where again, the third largest black population in the Western Hemisphere lives. The Colombian National Development Strategy is based on three main components. Extractivism of mineral, oil, and gas deposits, agro-industrial uh, businesses, primarily focus on, on, on cane for biofuel and palm oil, and now the, the large industrial-sized uh, operations of pork and chicken uh, farming. And lastly, uh, with the push for, or taking advantage to some extent of the language of sustainability, there is a tremendous increase in the, the development of hydroelectric dams. Uh, certainly the, the coal, you cannot have developments uh, without highways, and Buenaventura being the largest port in Colombia uh, and being the oldest port also that has a, a large black population in South America is a principal component in the very controversial Trans-Pacific Trans Partnership that is, uh, that our president, whoever of the two is going to get to do it, is going to get to approve without even congressional review. Behind all of this is really another, a fourth major component, which is the business of war. 
which is last, largely funded and influenced by the so-called drug war that will soon be upon black communities in the United States again with our incoming president. This is a map that represents all of the mining permits uh, given out in Colombia on black territories over the past, and this is a snapshot from 2008. And you can see that a tremendous amount of land has been uh, given away in permits. One of the companies is actually a South African company called Anglo Gold Ashanti um, that was actually involved in a massacre of around 153 workers a couple of years ago. So for those that are interested in African unity, I suggest that we consider with our hearts looking at the link of African unity and how its relevance to uh, afro descendant populations in South America as Anglo Gold Ashanti, that very old South African mining company has around two million acres of land uh, conceded to it for mining exploitation, and most of those two million acres are on black owned land. Similarly, the agricultural policies in Colombia are very much geared to make sure that they fit a broader international agricultural policy. And I think it's very important that as we consider uh, our studies, both in the political science and economic and cultural sense, that we look at the links between agricultural policies in our populations. I'll play this very quickly because one of the things that this is leading to um, is a tremendous exodus of black peoples in Colombia to, from their countryside into the cities. Uh, each, as the city says in the video, each one of these lines represents a one displaced person. And I'm sure we've all heard of the tremendous refugee crisis taking place in Syria. And we're probably hearing it because it's really impacting a lot of European countries. But I bet nobody here knew that Colombia actually has the largest internal refugee uh, population in all of the world. Colombia has uh, been marred in a 50-year-old civil war. And especially after 1993, the displacements of black communities from Colombia, uh, from within Colombia, has been absolutely disproportional. Of the 4.1 million people displaced internally in Colombia, 2.5 million of those refugees are black. And I'm certain that plays a factor in the fact that we don't know about it. And this was one of the, this situation of displacement from country black folk fleeing to the cities was really what, what in the end brought me here. Uh, it's hard, certainly in the North, growing up in the North, to not hear about the so-called Great Migration here in the United States. Um, and it was the, the massive displacement of the black population from the U.S. South to the west and to the north. And thankfully, a lot of that was captured, a lot of that history was captured in poetry and theater. And this is a, one of the main, most well-known poems by uh, author Richard Wright. And it says, I was leaving the south to fling myself into the unknown. I was taking a part of the south to transplant in alien soil to see if it could grow differently, if it could drink of new and cool rains, bend in strange winds, respond to the warmth of other suns, and perhaps to bloom. And this poem was written in the context of a massive displacement of African Americans from their rural country homes, from their ancestral hard-fought farmlands, into cities, as James Baldwin called it, into the cities of destruction. And so it was very difficult for me to ignore the parallels to an extent of the current Afro-Colombian displacement from their uh, ancestral homelands in the country into the cities and not compare that with the displacement of African Americans into the cities that occurred here in the United States. US, uh, Colombia is arguably the most 
has a focal interest of the United States in certainly South American politics, uh, arguably in all of Latin American politics as well. Of all the recipients of economic aid, only Colombia touches the top 10 with 839 million of so-called economic aid and again touches the top 10 in military aid from the United States. It is the only Latin American country that reaches the top 10 in both of those categories of US foreign policy. And I, considering the strategic interest of Colombia, I think that there's, it's an interesting point of study. There are many questions to ask here. Uh, from many uh, points of view and academic disciplines to, to look at the, uh, why that is. Um, regardless, the reality is that I think that there's a lot to be compared between the black populations in Colombia and here in the United States. Uh, the construction of hydroelectric dams uh, has displaced around 38 kilometers of ancestral mining sites and farmlands in Colombia. And I think any cursory, even cursory investigation onto the impact of the Tennessee Valley Authority's construction of the dam in Tennessee would reveal a very similar story. Uh, this has a tremendous impact, not just in Colombia. Again, I'm using this as an example to converse about the ways that, that the global African diaspora is linked to each other. Um, and it leads to uh, communities being separated from one another and ultimately linked to economic interest. The Salvajina Dam that displaces 38 kilometers is located upwind of the city of Cali, the second largest black population in Latin America. And all of these fertile lands in between were formerly owned by black, black families that lost them primarily to the predatory lending practices of the agro-industrial industry. 20 years later, a dam is built displacing other families with the excuse of making sure those lands that were usurped had the irrigation necessary for industrial scale agri uh, agricultural projects. This is a map showing active mining titles in Colombia. The, unfortunately, thanks to the, uh, the constitutional protections that black communities have fought so hard for in Colombia, they have halted the implementation of legal uh, development projects on their lands. What that, this has led to, unfortunately, is paramilitary and militias going into black lands and literally terrorizing folks off of their lands. And when that hasn't functioned, they've gone in and brought in uh, excavators like the kinds that we see in construction sites anywhere. Uh, I've seen a couple here in, uh, in Albany. Uh, bringing excavators and turning what was once a, a nourishing, fruitful, peaceful country life into, a, into rivers that have been destroyed into rivers that have been poisoned by mercury and cyanide, and now families do not have access to eating fresh fish daily from their rivers. The river has been a source of life for the communities. My research focuses particularly on how the practices of mothering and child rearing have changed as a result of the illegal mining activities coming in. The picture on the left, it's not some kind of general propaganda that we've seen about beautiful young black children in a third world country. This is just life in the community prior to the arrival of the illegal excavators. Uh, families would go together. You would see two-year-olds and 93-year-olds at the river uh, mining for gold in family, in community. And those have been replaced by the practice of the illegal mining activities that come into the communities, threaten the communities to, in order to force them off of the river, and then they go into another area and they dig a giant hole like this with their excavators that you see here on the left, and they force the families that want to continue mining gold as they've been doing for hundreds of years into these 
pockets of illegal mines. This is a, a mining disaster that occurred on International Workers' Day on May 1st, in 2014, where around 40 people lost their lives. You can see children, you can see families, because that is the way that communities there have known and have practiced their mining practices for hundreds of years. And this is all in a country that has been in civil war for many years, which the United States provides billions of dollars in military aid, which our country provides millions, hundreds of millions of dollars in economic aid, including tremendous support from the State Department for a number of initiatives. And despite the fact that there are military checkpoints about three miles, about every three miles, you still have excavators traveling through the territory with impunity. And despite the fact that you have helicopters and warplanes flying all over the territory, supposedly looking for uh, drug uh, transfers, uh, drug routes, uh, that for drugs that are ultimately coming into the United States, and supposedly the cause of our war on drugs here, uh, these excavators can get into the territory with impunity. But like black people everywhere, our folk are resilient, and we are resisting, and we are united, and we're filled with joy, and I gotta tell you, nothing fills us more with, with more joy than seeing the faces of our kin all over the diaspora. And so it's with that in mind that the Black Women's Mobilization for the Care of Life and Ancestral Territories has sent me uh, here to the United States, uh, has guided my international solidarity work with the task of reaching out to black communities in the United States, and specifically with HBCUs, to try to build some practical uh, infrastructures for African American students and students of the global diaspora to be able to come to Colombia, learn about the history, share their own history with the folks of Colombia, and be able to develop uh, some very, very, very absolutely unique educational experiences that are not just rooted in a, an undescript activism. We need environmental engineers. We need economists. We need political scientists. We need artists. We need theaters. We need singers. Um, I think that it's, it's the, the main um, request, the main call from the women that organized from the community of La Toma and, and marched all the way to Colombia's capital is to share the message of the value of land with black communities throughout the diaspora. Whereas here, most of the conversations that I've had about land, mainly with black farmers, um, and land is seen as a source of wealth, whereas in Colombia, land is seen as a territory in which your community lives. Land is seen as a source of life. Here, the discussions that we've had is understand uh, large land swaps and forest as natural resources fit to a deliberate scientific use of, of exploitation whereas communities in Colombia see those same, that same landscape as a source of nourishment of which they are a part of. The black women's mobilizations use the analogy that the same way that they breastfeed their children, so too the territory breastfeeds their communities. Whereas here, uh, there's a tremendous amount of land loss due to the lack of confidence that many younger generations have learned given the conditions that, uh, of agriculture that have been imposed here, um, many folks are selling their family inheritance. And even that concept, to a large extent, is a slightly different from the concept that is utilized in Colombia. Whereas instead of individual family inheritance, again, valued to a large extent on their monetary capacity, in Colombia, black communities' lands are typically considered a, an ancestral community legacy. And I think that part of the reason why we've come down to the HBCUs is to try to, to, try to foment specifically uh, interest in researching and asking the questions 
about what was the relationship to land that African American communities had in the South. What changes in family structure and family dynamics took place as the process of displacement of African Americans from their, from their lands intensified and got to the point where it is now? And to what extent are both national and international policies linking the processes of black land displacement and its impact on families? So with that, um, I leave you with a call to try to uh, keep an open mind and an open heart and a critical mind for sure. Um, with an eye towards building relationships to bring our students together. There is a tremendous interest of Afro-Colombian students to travel to the United States. Unfortunately, given the, the real inequalities that exist, the majority of Latin American students that come into the United States are not black students. And uh, I, I hate to be the bearer of the news that as much as Latin American countries like to claim that there is no racism, and there are no racial differences in Latin America, it, it just a cursory look of the wealth distribution, education distri uh, attainment distribution, and general opportunities, you'll find that the situations are very, very similar to what they are here. So while there are a lot of opportunities for funding students from different countries to come to the United States to study, there are two main phenomena that are occurring. One, most of the students that are taking advantage of those scholarships are not Afro-descendant students. And that responds to specific historical processes that are actually very much linked to the processes here. And two, the students that are receiving those scholarships, and again, most of those students are not black, are typically going to white, historically white institutions here in the United States instead of attending HBCUs. So with that, I leave you for a call for resistance and solidarity between our people. Here, based, uh, out of the U.S. South, I think there is a tremendous opportunity for black communities in the South to serve as one of the epicenters of the new wave of Pan-Africanism that really needs to take root, and it is taking root, because that young man right here, and you over here, and you over here, are the folks that are going to make it happen. Thank you very much. You've really inspired me to look into some more of this poetry by these people. That was really wonderful. It was really good. Um.